All right, we are now recording. Um, so let me introduce our speaker for this evening, Wednesday, October 28th, Chuck Sherrill. He's our state librarian and archivist. He was named the state librarian archivist by Secretary of State Trey Hargett in 2010. It's hard to believe Chuck's been there for 10 years now. This is after he spent 10 years working for the city of Brentwood at the Brentwood Public Library, which I hope if you're ever in Middle Tennessee, you get a chance to visit. It's a very fine library. Before that, he had also worked at the State Library and Archives, and before that, he was in Cleveland, Tennessee with their public library. Uh, Chuck is actually a native of Ohio, but he has spent most of his working life in Tennessee and done most of his research here. He's a genealogist and the author of more than 20 books on Tennessee history and genealogy and the editor of the Middle Tennessee Journal of History and Genealogy. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and turn it over to Chuck, and he is going to tell us all about Patriot Paths. Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you all for joining in tonight. I think um, that the pandemic has helped us learn how to do meetings like this, and uh, in, in many ways, that's a good thing because we can involve more people across Tennessee in these discussions than we were able to doing them in person. So I see uh, among the participants lots of old friends and others who I hope to get to know. And I just want to thank everybody for coming tonight to learn a little bit more about a project that we're doing at the State Library and Archives. I do want to clear one thing up. Jennifer mentioned that I came from Ohio, and I, I'm sorry about that, but I got here as quickly as I could. My ancestors, though, are all from Tennessee, and um, if it weren't for my family, the Tennessee State Penitentiary might have gone out of business long ago. So. I have deep roots here and uh, lots of famous uh, criminals in my past. Um, tonight, though, we're going to talk about Patriot Paths, which is a website and a project that we developed here at the Library and Archives over the last several years. It's still in development, but uh, it's, it is online, and I hope you'll uh, take a look after we uh, introduce you to it here tonight. Um, this is a project that we undertook in partnership with the state's technology division, where there are experts in graphic information systems, or GIS. And one of the people who's joined us tonight is Suzanne White, who was the primary person working with us uh, on the GIS part of this project. So I want to give lots of credit and many thanks to Suzanne for what she's done. And uh, when we're in the question and answer period, um, if you have technical questions about that sort of thing, we'll uh, ask Suzanne to chime in on those. So I'll start now by sharing my screen. And hopefully you can all see that. And uh, I'll remind you, as Jennifer said, if you have questions and we'll put them in the chat, I'll deal with them as we go to the extent that I can, but we'll get to them all uh, at the end, if not sooner. Um, the value of Revolutionary War pensions for research is known by many genealogists, but it's often overlooked by the general public who's interested in uh, history and their family, but they are wonderful records. These pensions were not given until 1818. So by that time, many of the Revolutionary War soldiers had already passed on, but those who applied uh, had to write in and explain their Civil War service. To the genealogist or researcher's benefit, this was before the days when pre-printed forms were the norm. So these old soldiers would um, basically provide a narrative telling when and where they enlisted, who they served under, where they marched to, what battles they fought in, and giving the story of their wartime experience. And there was uh, usually a clerk or they may have hired an attorney to help them with their paperwork. So this was all recorded by someone who was generally doing the writing for them. These records then were mailed into Washington, D.C. and were eventually preserved at the National Archives and are now available um, online. I'll talk about that later. 
the wonderful thing for the genealogist in these records is how many relationships are mentioned. Uh, lots of brothers who went to war together or widows who were applying for a pension and got their sisters to come and testify that they had been at the wedding and saw them married to the soldier. Um, in addition, there's also lots of amazing historical information about the Revolutionary War. For example, I learned from one of my ancestors' pension files that he participated in the scalping of Indians and in the raid on an Indian camp uh, as part of his Revolutionary War service. Until then, I'd never heard that white people scalped Indians. I thought it was the only, only the other way around. Um, so these files, as I mentioned, are now all available digitally, and we do have them online on a database that's free to all Tennesseans, and I'll share that information with you shortly. Um, tonight I'm going to describe how we gathered our data on the pensioners from Tennessee and show you the GIS tool that you can use from our website to view this information in various ways. By way of a little bit of background, um, you should know that Tennessee was not a state yet during the Revolutionary War. And in fact, when the Revolutionary War broke out, there were hardly any Anglo-Europeans living in what later became Tennessee. The early part of the settlement in Tennessee occurred in the northeastern part of the state, near the Cumberland Gap, where the great wagon road from the eastern seaboard came down into this area. They eventually started calling this the Wilderness Road because that's how settlers from the east launched into the then wilderness of Tennessee and Kentucky. The Revolutionary War ended in 1782, and this map from about that time shows that there were only four counties in Tennessee. You can see them up there in the upper right-hand corner. Um, today, we have 95 counties in Tennessee. North Carolina, of course, held title to the Tennessee country, and it uh, issued land grants to its Revolutionary War veterans in lieu, or Revolutionary War soldiers, in lieu of payment. So when a North Carolina soldier mustered out, he was given a, a little chip piece of paper that entitled him to so many acres in the Tennessee country. Many of those soldiers immediately sold those uh, warrants to land speculators, but some held on to them and eventually moved to Tennessee. Um, and most of those located their land in the middle part of Tennessee, what is now Davidson County and a hundred square mile area around it. So Tennessee ended up with a large population of Revolutionary War veterans, not only from North Carolina, but who were migrating west from all across the colonies. This project with Revolutionary War Pensions works in partnership with the map collection of the Tennessee State Library and Archives. So as you're looking at the, the migration uh, pattern of your soldier, we encourage you to go uh, to the map collection, which is online at the web address given here, sos.tn.gov slash TSLA is our website. From there, you can navigate to the map collection and search for maps of the area where your ancestors lived or for larger general maps of the state uh, in the early days. Uh, more than 500 of our best maps have been made available through the Tennessee Virtual Archives, which is another product of the State Library and Archives. Knowing all this about Revolutionary War pension applications and their value, we began thinking about how interesting it might be to look at all the Revolutionary War pensions applications for all of the pensioners who lived in Tennessee. Our first challenge is that pension records are not searchable by place of residence, so we had to find a way to identify all of the pensioners who came to Tennessee. Fortunately, the federal government was very concerned about all the money it was spending on pensions, so good records of pensioners were kept and were published by the Congress, and we have those publications. You can see here that they were lists of pensioners that told what their rank was, how much their pension was, when they began receiving it, and um, where they were living at the time. 
So we took the data from these lists, and there are many of them, and um, pulled out the names of all the soldiers who were in Tennessee at the time they were receiving a pension, and we created a master list of about 2,500 uh, Tennessee pensioners that we have been working with. So the next step after identifying all of these soldiers and putting them in a database was to actually read their pension files. So this is an example of a pension file. This is one of my ancestors, Burwell Thompson, who came from South Carolina to Franklin County, Tennessee. And this is the first page of his pension application, which he applied for in 1832. I'll mention that the 1818 pension law only applied to men who had served in the Continental Army, but in 1832, the pension um, fund was opened up to soldiers who had served in state militias. So there's a great flood of new applicants starting in 1832. And then in 1836, widows could apply for the first time. So Burwell applied in 1832 and received a pension of $80 a year. And his pension file is 31 pages long. So it's, it's probably average for one of these files. Uh, but reading through those pages and extracting the information that we needed for our project was tough. As you can see, these are not always easy to read and decipher. But our interns and staff here who work on this project have done a great job of pulling out the data. So let me divert just a second to mention where you can go to find Revolutionary War pensions, not just from Tennessee, but from uh, soldiers all over the colonies. Um, this is on our website as part of the Tennessee Electronic Library. The URL is www.tntel.info. And uh, on that page, you'll see a genealogy icon, which I've circled here on my screen. And if you follow through by clicking there, you can get to Heritage Quest Online. That's one of the databases we subscribe to. Every Tennessean can use this free. Uh, you're, you have to be using a Tennessee internet uh, connection uh, within the state. So if you're on vacation in Florida, this won't work for you. But if you're in Tennessee, you can log in and use this data free of charge, along with everything else that's there for you on the Tennessee Electronic Library. But there you can review the pension files and find out where we got the data from that we use to create our uh, Patriot Paths project. So now going back to Burwell Thompson, in reading through his pension file, we found the following um, points. That he was born in Granville County, North Carolina in 1759. He enlisted in Spartanburg County, South Carolina, and he enlisted several times, but that's the one we, we um, marketed. Many of these men enlisted for three month terms, so they re-enlisted repeatedly. He then moved to Madison County, Kentucky in 1795. And in 1808, when the Chickasaw Treaty opened up the area, he moved into Franklin County, Tennessee. So we, take, we um, read each pension application and found these points uh, of, of geographical locations that were associated with dates that we could identify for the soldiers. Some of them had many and some just had a few. Uh, it was remarkable how these soldiers moved around the country in a day when travel, of course, was very difficult. But it isn't unusual for a soldier to have moved from Maryland to Pennsylvania to North Carolina to Kentucky to Tennessee and then maybe on to Missouri after that before they applied for their pension. Uh, so these guys really, really made tracks. They, they took the country as their own after they helped to win its freedom. The job of our readers was to ident identify these geographic points and enter them into a database. Um, and as part of the application that was required in 1832, each soldier was required to give his birth date and birthplace, his enlistment date and place, and also to tell every place he had lived since the war, which was very helpful information. You might think that by asking for all that information, the War Department was creating a great historical record for us in the future. They did, but they didn't know that's what they were doing. They were just making sure that the same man 
didn't apply for a pension in several different states, and also using that information that he sent in to try to verify that he was indeed a legitimate soldier. Burwell, in his application, also mentions that his brother William was drafted in 1776, but he had just gotten married, and so Burwell substituted for William and uh, served six months fighting the Indians on the Catawba River. He then says that in 1777, his father sent him to Charleston with a load of produce for the market. He wasn't in the military anymore, but he was stopped by soldiers and forced to enlist because they conscripted his wagon. And so he just went with it and joined the army and served as a wagon driver for another three months. And then in 1832, when he applied, his brother Stephen Thompson was one of his witnesses testifying that he saw Burwell on the battlefield at Kings Mountain the day after the battle. So being a Tennessean and knowing that I have an ancestor who was at Kings Mountain, uh, I think gives me a certain kind of hillbilly royalty status. So that's just to show you all that you might learn from one of these pension files. Uh, careful reading will reveal a lot of information. So we took those points for every soldier and built this database. And I'm showing you an example here from for the Blair surname. You can see that there's a Samuel Blair and then a Thomas Blair listed in the soldier's first name column. Actually, these are two different Samuel Blairs. If you look to the left, you can see that we've got a number uh, for each pension file. It's a, an R or an S or a W. R means their pension was rejected, S means it was a soldier's pension, and W means it was a widow's pension. So we take the data for each of these um, soldiers and enter it into the database. We had to give the event an order, so we would so the timeline would reflect things in the order that they occurred. Then we had to indicate the event type, and then um, moving across the spreadsheet to add any notes along with the longitude and latitude of the, the geographic point that's mentioned. We have finished the data for, uh, well, we have online the data for about 1,000 a a soldiers, which you can use. Uh, we finished the data for another 1,000 or 1,200 and are just finishing up the last 200 or so, uh, and we will get all of that information added and online hopefully early in 2021. But you can use it now for those first 1,000 pensioners. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we worked with Suzanne White in the State Technology Office to produce a map showing all these migration points that are entered into this database. And here's what we got when we got the first thousand soldiers in. Oh, just a sec. Now, isn't that helpful? Um, Tennessee Orange has taken over the map. It's impressive to see all of these soldiers and, and their migration paths, which basically cover the whole, the whole known part of the country at that time. Um, but as far as a research tool, this doesn't really uh, tell you very much. So, Looking at the path of an individual soldier is more helpful, and you can do that through this website. So, for example, here's Philip Schaffler. He came a long way to serve in the Revolutionary War. He was born in Germany and came to the colonies actually as a British mercenary soldier. He was hired to come and fight against the colonists. Uh, but by the time he had spent a month or more on the ocean with all of those Brits, he was tired of them and decided when he got off the boat to join in with the colonists and serve on the other side. They landed at Cape Fear in North Carolina and he deserted uh, and served in the Continental Army through the remainder of the war. Now, if you're looking at this on the Patriot Pass website, you can zoom in on the maps to see uh, county boundaries and other details. One of the things I'll ask of you if you go online and use this site, if you have any suggestions for us about how we could make it more helpful or more user friendly, we'd love to hear that because Suzanne and the folks that she works with are still making tweaks to the, the software and the way it works. Um, but at this point, there are five different ways that you can look at the data on this site. The Patriot Selector is the simplest one where you can look at one soldier's path at a time. The Patriot um, 
list view, which is the one I'm showing here, will allow you to see the migration paths of more than one soldier at a time. Um, you see the drop-down list on the left side of the page, and you can scroll through that list to see the names of all the pensioners. So let's say that you are interested in the Jackson family, particularly this Mark Jackson. You simply click on his name to bring up his path, and it will appear on the map. The different colors of the points on the map represent the different events in his life. Um, so green is for a birth record, um, red is for an enlistment record, and then we have different colors for marriages and deaths uh, if they appear in the file. By zooming in, you could see that his birth was in 1742 in Brunswick County, Virginia, just there above the North Carolina line. And do remember that if all the soldiers said in his application was that he came from Brunswick County, we locate the geographic dot in the middle of that county. So he may have been from the east or the west side of that county, but these dots are just showing in general what his path was. In this view, I've added and clicked on a couple other soldiers, both named William Jackson, to show their paths along with Mark, who we were already looking at. You can see that the paths of all three of these soldiers came close together in southeastern Virginia. So a researcher interested in these Jacksons might be asking, what does this tell me about this family? Are these three Jacksons related because they all went to the same area in Virginia? Um, maybe, but further research in other records will tell. The genealogist using this tool also gets a picture in his mind or her mind about the soldier's path, which I think is very helpful. You can do a lot of reading and you can understand the names of the places where your ancestor was, but looking at it on a map and thinking about how he moved from one place to another uh, really helps you in your research to begin thinking about, well, maybe, maybe I need to think about records of this place or that place that was on his route. It's different from just seeing the information in the list. Another option on the software is called the Patriot Locations tool, and this enables searching by place rather than by the name of the soldier. I use this tool to find uh, the names of all the Tennessee pensioners who had a point, something that occurred in their file that happened in Rockingham County, North Carolina, up on the Virginia border. There were nine men who came to Tennessee who came through or from Rockingham County. Um, I then went back to the Patriot Selector tab to look at each of them individually and saw that three of them had very interesting similarities. I should mention that when I clicked on the county and it brought up this dialog box you see here, it says at the very top one of 10, and that tells me that there are 10 soldiers associated with that location. Then I use the arrow to tab through and re read the data about each soldier. So looking at these Rockingham soldiers on the uh, Patriot Selector tool, I chose three of them who um, seemed to converge. They were all born in Maryland. They all enlisted in Rockingham County, and they had all moved to Sumner County, Tennessee by 1826. So what does this mean? Are these three soldiers related? Now, I don't know. But if I were a researcher interested in any one of them, I would start reading the details in those pension files to see if I could find any connections. Who gave testimony in support of these men? Did they testify on each other's behalf? Are there details in their pension files that will help us identify um, any relationship between them? Another tool that's available is the density map. This uh, is more of interest, I think, to the scholar or historian, um, but it shows all the soldier points with uh, larger spots and deeper colors where more soldiers were located. Users can click on any of these points to see a list of all the soldiers that were associated with that point. Interestingly, uh, we did some research uh, to look at whether these were just, uh, these big blotches were just appearing on high population areas. And no, not necessarily. We can tell that groups of families from certain rural communities 
obviously all migrated to Tennessee together, uh, not just from larger locations. This is a different kind of density map, the enlistment tool. It shows uh, where the points related just to enlistment were located. The darker the color on the map, the more soldiers who came to Tennessee enlisted at that location. So you can see a real concentration down there along the Virginia and North Carolina border. So we know that lots of men joined the Army in those counties and then ended up migrating to Tennessee. Again, on this map, if you zoom in a county and click on it, you can get the list of all the pensioners who enlisted there. So I mentioned already that this is live on our website, and I would encourage you to go and play around with it and see what you can find. Remember that we only have about 1,000 soldiers already in the database, but within the next few months, we'll be finishing up uh, and adding another 1,500 um, it's our mission at the State Library and Archives to tell the stories of Tennessee and Tennesseans. And these new web tools have proven very useful for taking old records and looking at them in new ways. So I hope it will help you to do that with people and places that you're interested in in your research. And uh, please, again, do send us an email or call me uh, and tell me what you think about it and whether there are ways that you see that we could improve upon it. I'll stop sharing now, and if you have questions, we'll be glad to try and answer them. Okay. Um, yes, we have some questions that I can summarize. Um, so, in all, there's two around 2,000 Tennessee soldiers who applied for a pension. About how, 2,500. Any, but how many? 2,500. 2,500. Okay, actually, I'm going to stop the recording now so people don't um, have to uh, there. We're going to stop.